Poor little cricket, hidden in flowery grass, observes a butterfly fluttering in the meadow, shining with the liveliest of colors, azure, purple, and gold glimmer on his wings. Young, handsome, foppish, he floats from blossom to blossom, taking only from the best. Ah, says the cricket, how his lot and mine differ. Lady Nature blesses him with all and me with nothing. I have no talent, even less beauty. No one takes notice of me here below. I might as well not even exist. As he speaks, a troop of children enters the meadow. Instantly they run after the butterfly, which all desire to catch. Hats, handkerchiefs, caps, swoop to capture him. Unable to escape, he soon becomes their conquest. One catches him by a wing, another by his delicate body, yet another seizes his head. How little it takes to tear a butterfly to pieces. I me, says the cricket, I'm sorry no more. How much it costs to shine in this world. How I shall treasure my deep retreat to live happily, live hidden. The Flower Communion Service was created by Norbert Chopek, who lived from 1870 until 1942. And he founded the Unitarian Church in Czechoslovakia. He introduced this special service to that church on June 4, 1923. For some time he had felt the need for a symbolic ritual that would bind people more closely together. The format had to be one that would not alienate any who had forsaken other religious traditions. The traditional Christian communion service with bread and wine was unacceptable to the members of his congregation because of their strong reaction against the Catholic faith. So he turned to the native beauty of their countryside for elements of a communion which would be genuine to them. This simple service was the result. It was such a success that it was held yearly just before the summer recess of the church. When the Nazis took control of Prague in 1940, they found Dr. Chopek's gospel of the inherent worth and beauty of every human person to be, as Nazi court records show, too dangerous to the Reich for him to be allowed to live. Dr. Chopek was sent to Dachau, where he was killed the next year during a Nazi medical experiment. And this gentle man suffered a cruel death but his message of human hope and decency lives on through this flower communion, which is widely celebrated today. It is a noble and meaning-filled ritual, which we are about to cre recreate. This service includes some original prayers and readings of Dr. Chopek as well, to help us to remember the principles and dreams for which he died. Now we will have the consecration of the flowers, and that will be Joe. Infinite spirit of life. We ask thy blessing on these, thy messengers of friendship and love. May they remind us amid diversities of knowledge and of gifts to be one in desire and affection and devotion to thy holy will. May they also remind us of the value of comradeship, of doing and sharing alike. May we cherish friendship as one of thy most precious gifts. May we not let awareness of another's talents discourage us or sully our relationship, 
but may we realize that whatever we can do, great or small, the efforts of all of us are needed to do thy work in this world. The idea with the um, flower communion is that we bring a flower and then we receive a flower when we leave that is different from that which we brought. And as you can see, we have a beautiful array this morning, um, both still living and cut flowers as well from various gardens and places. So when all is uh, said and done, these will go back out to different homes. And now here's the message. Blossom, revive, resurrect yourself. I had lunch with my sister on Thursday, and she told me that she would be hitting the freeway for the holiday weekend because her offspring, her daughter, and her son, and her grand dog, who she's very proud of, and her new grandbaby all live somewhere southwest of here. So she said that she got in touch with her daughter-in-law's mom, who they're having Easter brunch with today. And she said, would you like me to bring something? I'm about to go shopping. I see they have hams on sale. I could bring a ham or a turkey. Would you like me to bring a ham or a turkey to your Easter brunch? And the response that she got was, well, I've got this incredible recipe for a breakfast casserole, and I'm going to put out fruit and waffles, and I think we'll be just fine. Then the next day, there was a contact made to my sister from her new daughter-in-law who said, um, gee, my husband, your son, says he cannot remember an Easter meal where there was no ham on the table. Would you mind calling my mom and making that offer again so that we can make him happy? My nephew is only just 30 in January. He's still a young man, and uh, he... Um, works as a concrete cutter, so he's kind of a macho guy. He uses a great big giant saw with a diamond tip to cut the concrete at work each day. And so you can forgive him for looking forward to the traditional Easter ham. <clears throat> so then she got a contact from my niece who said, gee, you know, Mom, my brother said that last year was the first year he can remember not getting an Easter basket. This is my nephew, the 30-year-old. Didn't get an Easter basket last year. Because last year we had a special family gathering. We all went to brunch at the Bonefish Grill, and my nephew announced that they were expecting a baby and that he and Rachel were going to be married as well. And he said, we didn't really know which order, but it turns out that we've decided to get married in June. Their wedding was on the summer solstice. The baby will come in the fall. She was born on my brother Ned's birthday, so we have two people in our family with this lovely October birthday. So my sister tells me this story, and she says, I didn't think that these things were so um, important to my son. Last year, I was busy, and they had an announcement to make, and she said, I just made a big community Easter basket from which we all could partake. That seemed satisfactory. I was in a hurry. My sister has a tradition of being the kind of Martha Stewart in our family. She's the one who is crafty. She decorates and she makes pie for holiday meals, and etc. So she said, I guess I didn't know how important these things were, Easter baskets and hams. And I said, well, I know that you couldn't resist the opportunity to make one for your grandbaby that says, baby's first Easter. I know you. She said, yeah, I've been planning that for quite some time now. And I'm making one for the little grand dog in the other household. They're both working in professional careers. And so they adopted a dog instead of having a baby because they wanted to practice rearing the young. So naturally, my nephew wants his daughter to know that there are many important things about Easter, and we mustn't forget baskets and ham. So, that put the question in my mind, what does Easter mean to you? This time of year, we get certain messages. Blossom. 
It's time for your revival. Resurrection is near. And these messages are a part of our culture and they flood through. We cannot forget the importance of baskets and ham. It had to be said. We've already celebrated the equinox, which pagans call Ostara. And the equinox, when there's balance between light and darkness, is when we really see the spring coming and all the flowers start. And I learned at Cracker Creek a few years ago that we have in Florida a fern that grows on the horizontal outstretching branches of oaks that you see as you cruise down Spruce Creek. There's a fern that grows on the branches of the oaks overhead called Resurrection Fern. Because when it's dry and when there's drought, it will appear to be dead. And then when rain comes and it gets moisture, it comes back to life and springs back into green. So I was thinking about that. Resurrection. What is resurrection? I was in Alaska at a place called Resurrection Bay next to the Kenai Peninsula. The town of Seward was built there. There were explorers, Russian explorers, Alexander Baranov and his crew, and they were in a terrible storm in the Gulf of Alaska. This is before there was any settlement in Alaska. It was really wild country, and they prayed for deliverance from the storm and discovered what they named Resurrection Bay. The storm calmed on Easter Sunday, and they felt that they had been rescued by the hand of God. Resurrection, revival, blossoming. I learned in biology class many, many years ago that there are annuals and there are perennials. And annuals are showy and make a big display of themselves, kind of like a shooting star. Perennials, on the other hand, last and stick around, and sometimes they're as old as Methuselah, which is my goal. I want to be like Charlie Barcelo. I want to live a long life, and I want to be a perennial, and maybe I'll get to blossom again and again, because you can experience a revival again and again if you happen to live long enough to see it come. My sister Sally only lived to 31. She was an athlete, a triathlete, an attorney. She just pretty much excelled at everything she set her heart on and died in a car crash, which was devastating for our family. And I thought, okay, well, maybe she was an annual. Her life was about presenting a great big bloom and making the most impression on the largest number of people possible. And then when she was gone, we all found ourselves saying, wow, we got so much inspiration from this person. And now she's not here and we have to do it. I have to tell myself in the mirror the things that my sister told me. You can do it. Yes, you can. Just do it. Make it happen. I have to be what she was for myself. I think there are people whose destiny is to be an annual in this way. Laura told a story, Laura Chilkett, about hearing a very inspirational minister say that when he thinks about the early Christians, the people who knew Jesus, that it seems to him that they might have been saying, Jesus lives, and meaning through his death, he has left a legacy that others have to live up to. If we don't pick up the mantle of being kind and compassionate and good to one another and treating other people as brothers and sisters, then somehow we fail, and we don't remember him properly. Well, I think that my sister left a lot of messages about how much a person can succeed in life and how they can serve other people and how they can do good things and be remembered for their good things. So I got it. I said, oh yeah, there's a tradition in Africa that when a person dies, as long as they are remembered with loving hearts, they live on. Good tradition. We resurrect people by resurrecting their memory. I was reading a story about a 27-year-old woman in Afghanistan. I wrote down her name because I couldn't remember it, Farkunda. 
She believed that little girls should have the right to an education. My sister would very much have approved of this. And this woman got into a dispute with the local imam or mullah. She was a devout Muslim, but she had an issue with her imam because he would go to a shrine in the town and he would sell trinkets that he said had the magic power of restoration. And he would sell them in particular to women who were in crises and were desperate. And this young woman, Farkunda, said, you know what? That's against our beliefs. He's doing something that's wrong. And it reminded me of Martin Luther when he decried the Catholic Church for the selling of alms, that people could purchase absolution for their sins by making a donation to the church. That wasn't acceptable. Martin Luther said, well, we're just going to have to shake up the world. And next thing you know, we had the Protestant Reformation. And so people have done this before. The tragedy is that this woman in Afghanistan, when she called out her local mullah for doing things that were blasphemous in her opinion, that were taking advantage, that were exploitative, she ran afoul of people in the power structure in her hometown who basically told her, you don't ever say anything against the mullah. And she was falsely accused of being an atheist, of being a rebel rouser, a troublemaker, it was said that she burned the Koran. And because of this, she ended up being beaten and stoned to death by an angry mob in her own hometown. 28 people later were arrested for the crime. Basically, that saying that you hear in school about sticks and stones, well, they beat her with sticks and stones. And then they ran, over, they ran her over with a car and they threw her into a river, and then they set her on fire. So she wasn't just killed. She was basically crucified. She was murdered in the most horrible way in an act of mob violence. Thirteen policemen witnessed and later were suspended because they didn't do anything to stop this crowd from mob rule making things right, or so they thought. And this woman had been scapegoated. She believed in girls getting an education. She didn't believe in people exploiting those who already were vulnerable. She pretty much had the same values that I see Unitarian Universalists having. And when it was time for her funeral, at this point, the truth had got out. The truth has a way of getting out. Over 3,000 people ended up protesting the death of this innocent woman. And when it was time for her funeral, the male family members stepped forward as is customary to be the pallbearers, and they were pushed out of the way by angry Afghan women who said, no, Farkunda was our sister, and we will carry coffin. Now I think my sister Sally would be really proud of this Afghan woman who lost everything at such a young age only because she stood up for what she believed. Farkunda's brother told reporters, my sister is a martyr and history will never forget her. If you had told her an everyday person living their life simply, just being who they are and believing what they believe, you will be world famous, she would have said, oh, that's crazy, get out of here. There's no way that will ever happen to me. And he said, my family has lost her. We lost a wonderful person. But the world has gained an inspiration. And Afghan women now are saying, remember Farkunda. The way that once upon a time people said, remember the Alamo, the way that we said, remember 9-11. There is something this woman stood for, which now will never die. Resurrection. Are you an annual? Are you a perennial? Maybe you don't even know. 
Am I a butterfly or a cricket? Sooner or later, everybody walks the path. The inspiration that Meg Barnhouse brought to me, and she wrote a song, Chrysalis, which you heard, because she wondered, does a butterfly miss being a pupa? Does a rose feel frightened that once it's let go of everything, they won't exist anymore? Or do they just do what they do? They fly, they blossom, they perform what is their role in the universe to perform. Do the stars come together in conference and say, which of us will fall? Who will be a shooting star and cease to exist, but burn into the memory of millions? We shall see. Blossom, revive, resurrect yourself. Happy Easter. And reverently, with a sense of how important it is for each of us to address our world and one another with gentleness and justice and love, I ask that you select a flower different from the one that you brought that particularly appeals to you. As you take your chosen flower, <coughs> noting its particular shape and beauty, please remember to handle it carefully it is a gift that someone else has brought to you. It represents that person's unique humanity and therefore deserves your kindest touch. Let us share quietly in this Unitarian Universalist ritual of oneness and love.